third seminar of the 2018 year. I'm Bob Stein, seminar's chair. For those who missed our last seminar on Korea with Chris Hill, the video is now on our website, uh, www.seminarsitseamboat.org. It also will be rebroadcast on Sunday, July 29 at 8 p.m. on KUNC, Public Radio of Northwest Colorado. Let your friends who missed today's seminar know that it also will be on KUNC on August 5th at 8 p.m. I would like to thank our sponsor for this seminar, Karen and Joel Piasek. Where are you? Thank you. And our supporting sponsors, Patty and Ted Grossman, and Colorado Mountain College. As always, thanks to our friends whose generous contributions enable us to bring out outstanding speakers such as tonight's David Sanger and keep the seminars free to the community. Tonight's Friends Dinner is full up, but there are still a few places for the next two dinners, so if you are a friend, please sign up. Also, thanks to the string staff for their technical and other help in making the seminars happen. A reminder, please shut down your cell phones, bots, trolls, and other cyber devices. <laughs> and as I mentioned to David Sanger, uh, who in his book, uh, The Perfect Weapon, talks about Olympic Games, uh, in Steamboat, Olympic Games have a very different meaning. <laughs> Volunteers will be passing out cards, get your questions in, and as I repeat every week, please try to make your questions legible. Tonight's introducer is Joella West of our board, Joella. This afternoon, we welcome back David Sanger, three-time Pulitzer Prize winner and national security correspondent for the New York Times. He is also the author of two Times bestsellers on foreign policy and national security. And his third book, The Perfect Weapon, How Cyber Conflict is Changing How Nations Compete and Conflict, was published last month. He last joined us here at seminars in 2010 when he spoke about the world and the challenges Obama confronts. It's a very different world today. He comes to us following the Aspen Security Forum where last Friday he mo moderated a panel discussion entitled Confronting Global Cybersecurity Threats, which covered the immediately preceding speech by Deputy Attorney General Rod Rosenstein on malign foreign influence operations. Seminars has focused on cyber issues twice before. In 2013 with Robert O. Harrow and in 2014 with Richard Danzig. The subject hasn't become any simpler with the passage of time. In fact, it has risen to the top of some very chilling lists. The number one threat to national security the weapon of choice for democracies, dictators, and terrorists. I bought Mr. Sanger's new book just after its publication last month, and I put it on my nightstand so I could pick it up at the end of the day as I was going to bed. <laughs> yeah, you got it. I don't have to finish that story. I, <laughs> I discovered that this was a bit like choosing to read The Haunting of Hill House as preparation for a good night's sleep. The perfect weapon, war, sabotage, and fear in the cyber age is one scary book. With that caveat, however, I'd like to point out that the book will be available for purchase tonight <laughs> as you leave the event. Off the beaten path has a table just up outside, uh, inside the exit doors. <laughs> 
um, and uh, David Sanger will be available to sign copies of the book. Uh, our one request is this. He will also be signing books at the Friends Dutch Treat Dinner. So if you are going to be attending that, we would ask that you wait until you get there to buy your copy and ask him to sign it. That way we have a chance of actually getting him out of here and to the dinner. Uh, with that, it's my great pleasure to introduce David Sanger. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, and uh, it's wonderful to be back uh, here in Steamboat. I remember when uh, I was last here, which I can't believe was eight years ago, um, we, uh, I, I still have the memory of this beautiful hall and, uh, and what a fascinating group of people we had and, and such great questions. Um, I didn't really mean to come here to scare you, you know, in the evening. Um, it, it, there, there, it was pointed out to me uh, recently by somebody that while there's a lot of narrative in this book and you'll learn a lot about the people behind America's offensive and defensive programs and what other countries are doing, it's probably not the like hang out on the beach read. Or at least so I thought until I was in Aspen a few days ago and I ran across you know, a place that's like full of intelligence officers and people who work at Facebook and Google and Microsoft and so forth. And I had three or four of them tell me that they were reading it on the beach at, on July 4th. I, I told them that they probably didn't want to advertise that that broadly. Um, I was reminded as I was driving over here what a just spectacular uh, state this is. Um, you make all of us jealous for those, those who don't, don't live here. Uh, my closest claim to fame is that my um, eldest son uh, graduated from Colorado College last year, a wonderful uh, institution that is... Uh, that's a really interesting town with the Air Force at the top and uh, this um, small liberal arts college at the bottom and sort of Colorado Springs in the middle. Uh, but uh, it's... Um, it's really a great place and a fabulous state, and I'm uh, delighted that uh, you're all here um, keeping it in such fabulous shape as I can see it is. So here is my plan for the night. I'm gonna talk to you for 35 or 40 minutes, and I brought along some slides, which I don't usually do for those who have um, uh, heard me before, but cyber is a complicated issue, and sometimes you need to be reminded of the analogies to things that are a lot more familiar to us. So I'm, I'm hoping that they'll help us through the narrative of this a little bit. And then uh, I'm happy to take your questions on anything you want. Um, cyber issues, uh, covering the Trump administration, that's exciting. Um, uh, the, uh, the moments that we've uh, had as the New York Times has tried to go navigate uh, what's been a, a relatively uh, treacherous world with the president who um, regularly tells us that we're the failing New York Times, although on occasion we've reminded him that what's kept us from failing has been, well, him. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm pleased to say that uh, we've never had more people reading the New York Times now that we're up around three million digital subscribers on top of... <laughs> And as somebody who uh, was once the youngest reporter wandering around the newsroom and now probably is looked on as I walk through that floor as among the older, uh, I have to say I've never seen the paper turning out uh, more compelling, investigative, cultural, every other form of journalism. And the fact that we've been able to devote so many people to the new issues of cyber, I think gives you an idea of just the scope and, and depth and of course, cyber, which initially I think many of our uh, reporters and editors thought was a somewhat um, uh, arcane subject, uh, and then began to see how it merged up with national security, has moved right to the center of the Russia hack. So I thought I would sort of start there, since I, it's been a little bit in the news lately. Um, so um, let me uh, see if I can figure out how they can make this go forward, because unfortunately those 
keys for the keyboard don't seem to be uh, moving it forward. Maybe somebody who's, yes. You see, you come to give a talk about cyber issues and There we go, okay. I'm not sure how well you can see this with the lights up and on, but we'll try as, as best we can, and then I'll ask you, I'll ask them to move the slides forward if uh, my own doesn't work. Um, so this picture was taken in the basement of the Democratic National Committee uh, in uh, December of 2016 when we were working on a fairly lengthy reconstruction of the Russia hack that, um, uh, went by the headline, The Perfect Weapon, which is uh, what helped inspire the name of the book, uh, and also was uh, one of the lead entries in the time submission that won the uh, 2017 Pulitzer Prize in International Reporting. The, um, the battered file cabinet that you see there is, if you look at it carefully, missing a handle on the bottom. I think if you found a file cabinet like this sort of on the street in, uh, uh, in the springs here, it would probably sell for about five bucks, which is about what it would be worth had this not been the original file cabinet that the Watergate burglars broke into uh, in 1972. Um, and uh, they had jimmied off that bottom handle in their effort to get inside. Um, they got about the number of files that you would imagine from uh, a four-drawer um, file cabinet, and uh, that wasn't terribly much. You'll remember they got caught because a guard noticed that the door was taped and called the police, and that began, that was the beginning of the end, or, the, or I should say the beginning of the beginning uh, of uh, the Great Watergate scandal. Um, to uh, the right of that, or its left, but your right, you see something very low and thin that looks like sort of an oversized laptop computer. That is the server for the Democratic National Committee from 2016. When you heard uh, President Trump the other day complaining anew that nobody had seized the server, that's the server he was talking about. We'll get later on to the question of why seizing it wouldn't do you a whole lot of good, but that's the one. To get into that server, the Russian hackers who um, went into it did not need to uh, jimmy open the door or tape it. They did not need to bust any handles. In fact, they were not in the country. And we now know from the indictment that came out about two weeks ago that they actually never had to leave Moscow. They did it all remotely. They got far more data out of this than uh, the Watergate burglars ever got. Whether it was terribly important or notable, we'll leave for all of you to judge. But the Watergate burglars were grabbing it just to conduct espionage. The Russians from the GRU, and we'll talk about them a little more, the uh, military intelligence unit, were grabbing it because they ultimately intended to try to use it to go influence an election. Now, we'll get into the discussion of whether or not they did influence it. I haven't really found very much evidence that what they did was very effective, but it certainly gave us a vision of the new world. So let me try one more time. Now, my keyboard isn't working, so we'll have to ask you to move it ahead. Okay, so this is Gutenberg. Not a whole lot changed in the world of um, technology, at least print technology, between the time that um, Gutenberg came along and the time that Windows came along, okay? We, we printed more quickly, but we were still basically printing on paper. And the information revolution changed all of that pretty quickly. Can I ask you to move on to the next one? So, um, in, Earlier days, around World War II and so forth, the Russians frequently put advertisements, including like the ones you're looking at, in newspapers around America, propaganda and so forth. Um, 
This one was obviously from home, it was cartoons they had. But the fact of the matter is, what the Russians have been doing in this election isn't new. Simply cyber has speeded them along to it. So you have to remember that what we're thinking of as something that's entirely different in American elections is actually something that we've seen before. It's been done to us before, and as I'll discuss a little bit later, we've done to others before. What's different now is that the technology that we're all using enables you to spread it much more quickly and presumably much more effectively in a much more targeted way. If you can go on to the next slide. So people frequently say to me, where are we in this cyber revolution? Why is it that 10 years ago we weren't thinking very much about these issues and today you can't turn on the TV and not hear about it? And my answer to them is that the best analogy to sort of figure out where we are historically starts here. This picture was taken on a muddy field in College Park, Maryland. Um, for those of you who know the University of Maryland at College Park and have been there, we probably have a few people here who have studied there at various moments, taught there. Um, this uh, field you're looking at is now their soccer field. But in 1908, it is where the Wright brothers went to go show off to the military something they called the military flyer. Now, I'm showing this to you because, as we all know, the airplane ended up being more than just another invention, another way of travel. It changed the nature of warfare, but it gave nations reach beyond their borders that they barely could have imagined before. Previously, if they were going to go uh, across their borders, it would either have to be a land invasion, which was pretty noticeable, or they would have to do this by sea, which took a while in most cases. But the airplane changed a lot of that. And so that a lot of generals came up from Washington uh, to take a look at this thing and try to figure out if they wanted to go buy some. There had been an earlier demonstration down by the Potomac, but the Wright brothers came to the conclusion that someone was going to get killed if they um, uh, flew this thing around in such a populated area. And then they were trying to avoid the difficult question that President Taft wanted a ride. And <laughs> they thought that might pose some aerodynamic difficulties. Um, so um, they showed this thing to the military, and the generals looked at it, and they said, this is fabulous, because we can run this thing up over enemy lines, see where their weaknesses are. It'll come back. The pilot will come out and tell us about it. And then we'll send the cavalry out to go attack in the open spaces. During this whole demonstration, no one ever actually thought about arming the damn thing. <laughs> now, that's pretty fascinating when you think about what happened in World War I just years later. But it also bears a similarity to the way we thought about the internet, the World Wide Web, in its earlier years. This was going to be a way for us to communicate. I'm old enough to have sat in the um, East Room cover when I was White House correspondent, covering Bill Clinton talking about why the internet should never really be used for commercial purposes. I guess he doesn't have Amazon Prime. Uh, so um, that didn't last very long. We had a sort of shortage of imagination about how this was going to be used. And then we had this concept, of course, that the internet would be a great force of democratization. In fact, President Clinton would go to Beijing. I would frequently travel with him uh, there as White House correspondent, and he'd give these great speeches at Beida, the University of Beijing. Uh, about how the Communist Party essentially wouldn't be able to survive the spread of information because as people saw how free people lived, uh, it would be very hard for governments to maintain the kind of monopoly on power and information that they did. And I think uh, the high point of that was the Arab Spring. We'll come back to that a little later in the talk. But we've had a very different lesson in recent years. And the lesson we've learned is the same lesson that was learned 
uh, after the Wright brothers did this demonstration. Can you go on to the next slide? So in about 10 years, really less, we moved to this. The Germans figured out how to arm this. We figured out how to arm these. We had made 14 military aircraft around 1910. A few years later, we made 14,000, right? By World War I, we were having dogfights. U.S. wasn't particularly involved, but the Germans certainly did, and uh, the British certainly got to it. I keep a book that I bought in London years ago, um, just about, I guess, two years ago as I was beginning to write The Perfect Weapon, uh, that was called um, The Aeroplane in Peace and War. And it had my favorite chapter, it was published in 1908, same year as that demonstration. My favorite chapter has got the headline to it, Could London Be Bombed? And I got the answer to that pretty quickly. If we go to the next um, slide, we got to this point in, by the early 1940s, uh, which was uh, the Zero fighter jet. My dad, who was about to turn 95, had a, his job was as a, as a um, fighter director on a destroyer, and he, um, he still wakes up thinking about these oncoming planes, which he always said sounded like um, lawnmowers. Um, and then if you go to the next slide. We then got to this just in a few years. That's the Enola Gay. That was 1945. And the next slide, please. And of course, to Hiroshima. Now think about that. 1908 to 1945, not even 40 years, when the airplane was invented, Nobody could have imagined it as a delivery vehicle, and certainly they couldn't have imagined it delivering a weapon like the atom bomb, because the atom bomb was nowhere near invention at that point. I make this point because while there are no perfect analogies to the cyber age, and most of the nuclear analogies do not work, for reasons I'll describe in a bit, it is certainly true that we have to have a fair bit of humility about how cyber is going to be used as both a force of good and ill. Because we are at the very, very early stages, very early stages of this technology. And if it gets merged up, as the airplane did, with something that it could deliver that would be much more fearsome, then we're going to deal with a problem much larger than we can imagine today. On the other hand, if we figure out how to control it early on, we may have some hope of making sure that this, this story ends differently than the other did. If you go on to the next slide. So this says the world 10 years ago. I, I made this slide at the end of last year. I guess I need to update it. But in 2007, if you go through the um, intelligence community's annual report to Congress about the threats to the United States, it's an unclassified report they do every year, um, and you read the cyber section of it, um, it won't keep you up at night, you'll be glad to know, because there is no cyber section to it. 2007, terrorism was the number one threat to the United States, a lot of discussion about the future of Iraq and Afghanistan, as you would imagine, a good deal of discussion of nuclear proliferation, as you would imagine, still a threat, obviously, to us today, but absolutely no mention of cyber, period, 11 years ago. And next slide, please. The iPhone got introduced about three or four weeks after that um, threat assessment came out. And it made all the difference. It made the difference because suddenly everybody was carrying a significant computing device in their pocket. A computing device that had much more power than the computers that took up rooms in the 60s and 70s. Mobile computing was what created the way for us to have our entire lives on a single device. When you think about it, 
the least important part of your phone is the phone part of it, right? I mean, we call it a phone out of habit, but you're texting on it, you're banking on it, you're keeping your medical records on it, you're keeping your financial records on it, you're keeping the pictures of your kids and your grandkids on it. The number of times you actually use it as a telephone during the course of the day, probably pretty small as a percentage of the number of times that you use it. And that created a vastly bigger attack surface for anybody who was seeking a way into our networks. Because suddenly, we had proliferated the number of computers that were out there. Now, that's nothing compared to what we've done now. Now that you have an Alexa in your living room, and now that you have a smart TV in your bedroom, and now that you have an internet-connected refrigerator, I'm not entirely sure why you need an internet-connected refrigerator, but if somebody can tell me by the end of the day, that would be great. And of course, you have more microprocessors in your car than you have in your house. 10 years ago, you basically had one or two ways into the internet, if any, in your house. And today, you have more than you can count. And as the internet of things spreads, you're going to have way more than you can count. This begins to explain why it is that we are so vulnerable. Because while our cybersecurity has improved some, you've now using two-factor authentication, or if you're not, go get it as soon as I'm done with my talk. Um, and that's, of course, when you get you know, a number that's beamed back to your cell phone before you take money out of your uh, bank account or something. But while we've improved our security some, the attack surfaces have increased dramatically, wildly outpacing our ability to keep up with it with our own new defenses. If you can go to the next slide. So what's the world today? For the past four years, that same threat assessment, when it reaches Congress, always has the same number one threat. It's cyber, ahead of terrorism, ahead of nuclear proliferation. It says something interesting about the advanced knowledge of our intelligence agencies that you could go from not being mentioned to being the number one threat in basically six years, right? Um, General Jim Clapper, the Director of National Intelligence, who, as I was driving in here, I read President Trump uh, wants to revoke his security clearances, because um, he's been critical of him along with, with others, um, uh, said, told Congress, when this first wording began to show up in these reports, that cyber attacks on the United States have soared in scale, sophistication, and severity of impact, uh, and that while we're all still worried about that Armageddon-style attack, he means the sort of cyber Pearl Harbor you used to hear about, in fact, that's probably not the most likely attack. And I think if there's a lesson of the past couple of years for all of us, it's that our fixation on stopping the cyber Pearl Harbor, the uh, attack that takes out all the electricity from Boston to Washington or San Francisco to LA, actually has blinded us to much more subtle uses of cyber as states have seen an opportunity to come in and use it in a short of war way. And that is to say, a way that would not provoke us to take military action against them. The new head of Cyber Command was at Aspen on uh, Saturday evening, and he was asked some about this. And he kept mentioning the short of war issue here, because it is the central issue. You keep hearing people say, we're at cyber war. We're not, at least not yet. We are in a constant, low-level cyber conflict that states are dialing up and dialing down to stay just below the threshold of war, just below the threshold that would prompt a president to send in the special forces or the US Air Force. And the question for the next few years is, 
how well do both all sides calibrate that? Now, let's go on to the next. Um, when you think about cyber, you have to think about the different uses of it. And we're tempted at, to call almost everything a cyber attack. And they're not. So there are sort of four, um, can you go, go ahead again to where you were a moment ago? Um, great. So this is to try to get you to think a little bit about how states use cyber. So the first way is plain old espionage. I don't actually find that all that interesting. I mean, in the old days, they would intercept your letters. Then they would go intercept your phone calls. Now they're intercepting emails. OK, same thing we've seen for a long time, just a different technology to get to it. The second is the manipulation of data. Now here you get to something a lot scarier. The thing that you, reason you might not want to keep the perfect weapon is your bedtime reading. Because imagine what can happen with very subtle manipulation of data. We worried about it during the 2016 election when we learned that the Russians had gotten inside the registration systems. And I can understand why that would be, because Bob could go to vote in Washington where he has a full-time residence, although looking around here, I keep asking why. Um, <laughs> and if, some, if the Russians had gotten into the system, they might say, well, this shows that you moved to Arizona three months ago. How's the weather down there? You could imagine the chaos that could be sown, not even by getting into voting booths, but just by getting into registration systems, which we'll come back to because it's one of the issues that really worried the Obama White House in 2016. But there are other things you could do to manipulate uh, data. Supposing somebody got into the military's medical records database and managed to change the blood types of everybody who signed up in the military. Imagine for a moment that you got into the command and control system of our nuclear arsenal and changed the targeting. Imagine you got into the control system for your new fancy autonomous vehicle and when you went in to go to the supermarket, you instead headed right over a cliff. These are all very subtle ways that information can be manipulated. And the concern about it is not simply the damage you can do, but the psychological damage you can do, because it means that people no longer trust the systems around them. That you wouldn't trust that when you go to vote, that the ballot is going to be cast the way you intended, that when you got into your car, that you wouldn't go where you intended, that when you went to the doctor, that the record he had in front of him may not actually reflect what's going on inside your body. That is one of the reasons that we've got a real concern going forward. So that's manipulation of data. Then there are destructive purposes, and that's to do via cyber what previously you could only do by bombing something or sending in saboteurs. And we'll get back to that with the other Olympic Games. And finally, to achieve political goals. So I'm going to show you a few of the hacks that burst in front of you in the newspapers in recent times. And we're going to sort of categorize them. So if you go on to the next slide. Um, on the left side there is the F-35, the most expensive the most ridiculously expensive weapon system you have ever paid for. It's not flying that much these days because the pilots are saying that they're running out of oxygen when they're uh, up in the cockpit, and they're solving that and many other problems. To the right is the Chinese version of the F-35. If it looks very similar, it's because they got inside the computer systems of the contractors, and they're making their F-35, as you can imagine, significantly cheaper than we are. It was a hack, yes. It was espionage, absolutely. Just made a little bit easier than having to put somebody 
in the plant to steal the blueprints. Is it cyber war? Mm, not in my book. Let's go on to the next slide. Okay, destructive purposes. We talked about that before. This is uh, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad. You will remember him as the last um, president of Iran. Uh, he was ousted uh, by the current regime, and they're the ones who negotiated the Iran nuclear deal. In this picture, he is walking through the Natanz nuclear enrichment plant. And those big steel um, tubes you see there are centrifuges. When you hear about nuclear centrifuges, these are the machines that spin at supersonic speeds. There's a rotor inside. You can't see them, but they're inside those casings. And they separate out uranium and purify it. And that's basically the, one of the two processes you can use to make a nuclear weapon. You can also use these just to make fuel for power plants, which is what the Iranians said they were up to. Now, the most sophisticated attack that the United States ever conducted, and one that in The Perfect Weapon I describe anew as I had described it in uh, my previous book as sort of original sins, was an attack to destroy these centrifuges, not by bombing them, but by speeding them up and slowing them down until they exploded. And you can imagine what a big mess these things make when they explode. It's like being next to the world's largest hand grenade. And using cyber techniques, the United States actually took out about 1,000 of these centrifuges, along with Israel, in an operation that, as Bob suggested to you, was codenamed Olympic Games. No, they did not have the Olympians uh, uh, of, uh, of your town uh, in mind uh, at the moment. Um, let's go on to the next slide, if we can. This was a story which ran in June of 2012 uh, that, just as a book, previous book I had done called Confront and Conceal came out, that described how President Obama had ordered this attack. Now, what's interesting about it is that when he got down into the Situation Room, having inherited this program from George W. Bush, the question that he asked a lot of people was, what do we do once the word of this gets out, as he knew it eventually would? Are the Chinese and others all going to conclude that this opens the way for them to conduct similar cyber attacks, maybe not under the same rules that we're conducting ours? Is this going to start a new era in which weapons are used in this way? And the answer, of course, was yes, that's exactly what it did. Not because any journalist exposed this. Two years before I published this story, the, the code that we used against the Iranians to speed up and slow down these centrifuges got out. There's a lot of debate and dispute about how it got out and whether we were responsible or the Israelis were responsible. I was just in Israel uh, a week and a half ago um, working on a story that you may have seen about how the Mossad got into to steal the Iranian nuclear designs. And inside the Mossad headquarters, they still complain that uh, it was the Americans who messed this up and not them. And if you go ask people at the National Security Agency and elsewhere, they'll tell you the reverse, um, which is a fascinating debate considering that both countries aren't supposed to acknowledge that this set of events ever happened. Um, um, but whatever the reason, once that code got out, the Iranians had it, the Chinese had it, the Russians had it, and yes, elements of the code, which was called Stuxnet, you may remember the days when that was in the headlines, Elements of that code have been cut up, repurposed, and shot back at us. And that really gets to one of the central issues about offensive cyber. You can't really keep it secret. The code gets out there. And anybody who's really skilled will figure out how to go pick it up like an unused shell out in the, on the beach and figure out how to shoot it off again, maybe for a different purpose certainly with a different target. Let's go on to the next slide. So what's the post-Stuxnet world look like after we use this code? 
When I wrote that last book and was, was writing about this attack on Iran, I could not find another sophisticated cyber attack one state against another. And that was just 2010. I found a few not terribly sophisticated, what you call denial of service attacks, you know, where somebody overwhelms a bank's computer systems and freezes it up. But not something that did what Olympic Games did, which went in, pretended to be normal code, fooled the operators who were running the nuclear power, the, the nuclear enrichment center into thinking that everything was fine, and then all of a sudden they were hearing explosions downstairs and sending the summer interns down to go check it out. <laughs> As I was working with a group of research assistants um, on the perfect weapon, we went back to look at how many sophisticated cyber attacks we could find one state against another. We stopped counting somewhere between 200 and 250. And those were just the ones that became public. You've got to know that most of them probably didn't. Here's just a little list. The Iranians attacked Saudi Aramco not long after we did Stuxnet to try to go mess up their oil production. The North Koreans went after the South Koreans in an operation called Dark Soul. It went after their financial institutions and their media companies. The State Department, the White House, the Joint Chiefs of Staff were all attacked by the Russians. We'll come back to that in terms of the Russia hack. The Sands Casino, this was one of my favorites. Um, Sheldon Adelson owns the Sands Casino. He went to Yeshiva University one day and uh, suggested in a talk that the way to solve the Iranian nuclear problem was just to detonate a weapon in the sands of Iran in the desert and tell them that um, Tehran would be next. Well, about three months later, the operators of his casino showed up at work, turned things on in the morning to get the gaming going, and discovered that their hard drives had all melted down. It was a subtle message, but it was effective. There's a German steel mill that also melted down. We think it was the work of Russia. There's Sony, which we'll get to in a moment, and the Office of Personnel Management, which was attacked by the Chinese. OK, let's move on to a couple of these. Go to the next slide. OK, this was the poster for a movie called The Interview that Sony made. It envisioned the assassination of Kim Jong-un, who you can see down at the bottom down there. Um, for those of you who are trying to think of you know, good sort of summer downloads, let me save two hours of your life. <laughs> this is a truly terrible movie in my judgment, although when I suggested that at Aspen the other day, um, I, I got a, a huge Twitter campaign um, uh, that was directed at me, and among those who tweeted back that I clearly didn't understand the movie and appreciate it was Seth Rogen himself. So I was, I was, I was, I was uh, uh, deeply honored by that. Um, the poster is better than the movie. The poster's pretty great. And the movie envisioned that two journalists were being sent to North Korea to go um, interview Kim Jong-un, and the CIA would, recruited them to go uh, get rid of him. Now, I've been kicking around newsrooms for more than three decades, and I can tell you, if you were going to go out and hire some hitmen, I could not think of a worse place to go do it <laughs> than in the newsrooms of the United States. But that was the movie. So let's move on to the next slide. That's Jim Clapper, who we talked about. He's got an interesting book out of his memoirs. Um, and he is meeting there a North Korean general during a trip he, that Mr. Clapper took in 2014 to win the release of an American who had been imprisoned. If the general looks familiar, he's the same guy who showed up in the Oval Office a few months ago with that giant oversized letter, you know, the one that made it look as he handed it to President Trump like somebody had just won the um, Publishers Clearinghouse <laughs> Awards. Uh, that was the letter from Kim Jong-un, and that uh, led ultimately to the Singapore summit. At the time these men all met, it was pretty interesting, because the North Korean general ran the Reconnaissance General Bureau, which is basically North Korea's CIA, 
and they were running the hack on Sony to stop the movie from coming out. Director Clapper, who was a true professional, an Air Force officer, had no idea Sony was being attacked. And as he said to me when I went to go interview him, how would we? Our defense system is not set up to go look at what happens at private companies. And private companies wouldn't really want us, the government, to be inside them. Let's go on to the next slide. Oh, one more thing about that meeting in North Korea. The two of them had dinner. And um, the North Korean general stuck uh, General Clapper with the bill. And you can't use American credit cards in North Korea. It turned out they did take American dollars. So, um, Sony's ha the North Korean hackers went into the Sony computer systems in September of 2014. And they were true professionals. They did not just go in and attack. If you are doing a cyber attack with care, you go in and you spend months, months, feeling out the system, understanding how it all operates. So this image did not show up on the screens of Sony employees until uh, right after Thanksgiving of that year. They had spent, the North Koreans had spent three months understanding the system. And while you may remember the Sony hack for the release of some emails of studio executives and the remarkable discovery that they spend ungodly sums of money at lunch, and that uh, they believed that Angelina Jolie was a little difficult to work with on the set. The most important thing to know about that hack is that it destroyed 70% of Sony's computer systems. When this thing went on the screen, it was a distraction. And in fact, what the code was doing was wiping the hard drives clean. And the only people who saved their data used that very high-tech method of reaching behind their computer and unplugging it so that the hard drive stops spinning. Let's move on to the next. So here you had a cyber attack on a private company that was not really considered critical infrastructure and that was intended to basically free, free speech. And inside the Obama White House, there were suddenly situation room meetings going on about an attack on a private company. And they were trying to figure out what this is. Is it an act of war? Is it an act of commercial sabotage? Is it just vandalism, as President Obama at one point called it? He had to get briefed on this. He was not briefed by these two guys from the movie. <laughs> but I did get to his briefers, and if you go to the next slide, the briefers said, I never thought I'd be here briefing on a bad Seth Rogen movie, sir. <laughs> President said, how do you know it's a bad movie? He said, sir, it's a Seth Rogen movie. <laughs> you can go on to the next slide. OK. So the president spent a few weeks trying to figure out this. He came down to the press room, and he said what you see here. We cannot have a society in which some dictator someplace can start imposing censorship here in the United States. Think about this. We had no image that the Russia hack was coming. But the president was saying that the crime here was not simply breaking into computer systems, but rather trying to go after some of our fundamental liberties. Go on to the next slide. OK. So what did the president do? He imposed a few sanctions on the North Koreans that I doubt they ever felt, given all the other sanctions we have on North Korea. And briefly, North Korea's internet services stopped, we think, because the US told the Chinese to go in and stop them. Why didn't we do it ourselves? Because all of North Korea's circuits for their internet connections at the time ran through China. And if you go into another country's computer networks to get to a third country, it's very possible that the Chinese would think that we were directing the attack on them. And frankly, ordering an attack on a country like China with its own nuclear weapons is a very different thing than ordering an attack on a country like North Korea. And so we were very hesitant to go do it. 
And this is a big problem in cyber because the connections run everywhere. And you may be aiming at one country, but you may have to go through two or three others to get there. Now, OPM was pretty remarkable. Anybody here who's had a security clearance and that has not been revoked by the president tonight um, <laughs> may remember filling out an extraordinarily long form, it's called an SF-86, Standard Form 86, that lists basically your entire life. We're not just talking about your social security number and your date of birth. It's every relationship you've been in, everything, everybody, every foreigner you've ever met, every medical incident you've had, your finances, any bankruptcies. It's your whole life. These were stored in the computer systems of the most boring Washington bureaucracy you can imagine. It's called the Office of Personnel Management. They kept 22 million files on Americans who either had security clearances or applied for them or were contractors. And they encrypted none of them. They had less protection on it than you have on your bank account. In fact, they didn't even keep them at OPM because Congress had mandated that you use unused computer storage space rather than go out and get expensive cloud services someplace. So they stored them at the Department of the Interior, where they got all the same deep protections that we give to, say, bison migration in Yellowstone. <laughs> the Chinese came in, and for a year, they cleaned out these files. We didn't even notice. We did not name the Chinese when we discovered it. And when we did discover it, what did we find out? that the Chinese encrypted the files on their way out so that we wouldn't see them. After this whole incident was over, I noticed in the Federal Register one day that OPM was seeking a contract for somebody to go encrypt their files. So when I wrote about it, I suggested that we just give the contract to the Chinese because they'd already done it. <laughs> Government lawyers did not think that was as funny as I did at the time I wrote it. Okay, what did this tell you? We protect all kinds of files at the Department of Defense. We have huge amounts of protection and now encryption at the CIA and many other intelligence agencies. We were not thinking about the value of this information. And one of the reasons we weren't thinking about it is that if you stole 22 million files from the United States government 10 years ago, you wouldn't know what to do with it. You'd be drowning in information. But if you can apply big data skills to that, you can begin to create a map of who's working on what inside the US government, who worked with whom, who knows each other, who lent money to each other, who slept with each other. It's a really remarkable capacity to do something far more than just espionage. How did the United States government respond to this? First, by not telling the American people that it was China, even though they all knew it was. And secondly, by sending the victims of this a nice little notice assuring them that they'd gotten them a full year of free credit monitoring. <laughs> As if the Chinese were doing this because they really wanted to go to Target with your credit card. Let's go on to the next slide. Um, General Clapper said that this was merely espionage on a grand scale. And he told Congress, if we had the opportunity, we would have done the same thing, which I actually believe is probably true. And that raises the question, if you steal this level of data on 7% of the US population, and that's what the 22 million roughly comes out to, have you done something more than just snoop around. And I would argue you probably have. Now let's go on to the next slide. OK. So we're back to the Russia hack. You guys all know the outline of the story. I won't give you much more on it, and I want to get to your questions in just a moment. But the essence of this was that the Russians, as I suggested before, had attacked the State Department had not been named by the Obama administration, and it paid no price. 
Then they went into the unclassified email systems of the White House. It took two weeks for the NSA to battle the Russians and get them out. And every time they tried to get them out, they fought their way back in. Not because the emails were terribly interesting, but because they wanted to show us that they could. Same thing at the Joint Chiefs of Staff. In the book, you'll see this whole story laid out at great length. If you are Vladimir Putin and you think to yourself, those Americans are not going to go work on defending the White House or the State Department, why are they, would they ever care about the Democratic National Committee, which is basically you know, perpetually broke and staffed by a bunch of college kids? And in fact, the story gets worse. We first discovered that a Russian intelligence agency, not the one that made everything public, was inside the DNC in the summer of 2015. Our intelligence agencies found out about it. They passed word to the FBI. The FBI gave it to an overworked um, agent. The agent called the DNC. He got switched to the help desk. It took nine months for them to basically exchange phone calls back and forth with a bunch of young IT professionals in their 20s not believing the guy on the other end of the phone was a special agent of the FBI and certainly not believing that the Russians were inside. And it wasn't really until April of 2016 when the British began to see um, emails with headings from the DNC running in the networks of the Russian GRU, the Military Intelligence Unit. And they sent a note over to the NSA and said, you guys have got a problem out here. The Dutch also saw it. The US tells me eventually they saw it. I think the British saw it first. But no matter who saw it first, what does that tell you? The Russians were inside the Democratic National Committee for nine months before we even realized it or anybody told the President of the United States. There are babies in America who were conceived and born in the time it took us to figure out that the Russians were inside one of the main elements of our political system. And once the US government woke up to it, a big debate broke out in the White House about how to respond. Do you go do something to Vladimir Putin? unplug him from the world financial system, reveal his connections to the oligarchs, reveal the billions of dollars he stashed away someplace, make some of it disappear. All of these sound pretty appealing until someone comes along and says, let's think about what happens next. Do we want to set a precedent in which money disappears from the financial system? Well, the Fed and the Treasury had a couple of strong opinions about that. Let's say that you expose Putin's connections to the oligarchs and the Russians look at it and sort of yawn and say, oh, this just in, Vladimir Putin's got friends who are oligarchs. So it was not easy to go figure out what to do. And this is a key problem in cyber because we are the most vulnerable nation on earth. We've got, we're connected to everything as are many of our allies. And many of our enemies and adversaries are not. So you have to begin to think of things outside the cyber realm if you're going to try to retaliate against them. What's missing from this system right now is any sense of deterrence. The old idea that you'll hear politicians go back to time and time again, that we need mutually assured destruction for cyber, just tells you they haven't thought very hard about it. Because this isn't a situation where you're threatening massive destruction of the country. In fact, it's not a situation in which you necessarily know right away who attacked you. When the New York Times got attacked by the Chinese, it first looked like the attack was coming from a university in the southern United States. It's not like you can go into the big cave in Colorado Springs and see where the missiles are launching on a big screen. In fact, it's almost dead certain that the place it looks like the attack is coming from, it isn't coming from. 
So if you started bombing there, you'd have a problem. So we need to begin to think up a system in which we not only use more technological controls, that kind of two-factor authentication we were discussing, but that we also are beginning to think about what arms control looks like in this realm. And it's not gonna be easy, because in the old days of arms control, we sat down with the Soviets and then with countries that had nuclear weapons, and there were only nine, right, there are only nine today, and we signed treaties. Cyber is used by states, by criminal groups, by patriotic hackers, by teenagers. I don't know about in your house, but when I, when I had teenagers in my house, they didn't sign treaties, okay? <laughs> so that method isn't gonna work, and the technology will grow faster, will develop faster than the treaty would ever make its way through. And we have a few people in this community here who designed a few treaties from the nuclear age. I'm looking at a few of them. And um, it's a fabulous model, but it just doesn't fit the cyber problem very well. So then we have to think about some norms of behavior. Brad Smith, who's the president of Microsoft, and uh, the chief executive of Siemens have begun talking about something called a digital Geneva Convention. Think about the Geneva Conventions. They were made to protect civilians. And they were not negotiated initially by governments. They were organized by the Red Cross. Now, supposing we sat down and we came up with a list of things that we thought should be off limits to cyber attack. This would be a, a great barroom experience, but since we don't quite have the bar here, let's just tick through a couple. Election systems, okay, that's an easy one. Hospitals, nursing homes, emergency communication systems. We could probably find five or 10 other things to put on the list. Now imagine that you go circulate that list to say our intelligence agencies. Election systems, well, I understand why you might want to go do that, they might say. But remember, we fooled around with the Italian elections in 1948. In Latin America in the 50s and 60s, we ran a coup in Iran in the 50s. I could imagine a day when a president of the United States might well decide that it would be easier to mess with a foreign election than to go to war. Electrical systems, when you get into the book, you'll read a chapter about something called Nitro Zeus. It was the American military plan to unplug Iran if we went to war with Iran. Now that was avoided by the 2015 nuclear deal, which I read has run into some troubles. But um, <laughs> it told you that the military is moving to an era in which we use cyber first to try to avoid having to fire a single shot. And in fact, one of the people who helped design that program is now the new head of the NSA and US Cyber Command, which is, was recently elevated and has 6,200 cyber combat mission soldiers who are up and working on both defense and offense. So it's not as if we're at a point where sometime in the future cyber will be used in our military exercises and our planning. It's happening now and the Chinese and the Russians know it, and it's happening in their plans too. That's what cyber war would look like. We're not anywhere near cyber war yet. We're at low level cyber conflict. So I hope in this conversation, I've just given you a way to sort of think about the spectrum from espionage to manipulating data, including the kind of data that you saw here to information warfare, to future uses we can't imagine. And that's what we've got to get out ahead of. Now the reason for optimism here is people invented this system. Americans dominated the internet, we invented the internet. Well, Al Gore invented the internet, but let's <laughs> set this aside. Um, we ought to be able to figure out how to control this but we have to get out and do it ahead of time. So I'll leave it at that and be happy to take your questions and thank you very much for having me back here.
Here, here's an interesting one. In your new book, there are a number of references to the DNC and the experience with hacking the DNC, but none to the RNC. Was only the DNC hacked by the Russians? Do we have any idea the answer to that question? Sure. Uh, it's a very good question. Um, the RNC was also hacked. Uh, a contractor that had been used by them uh, was hacked. It turned out they didn't find anything terribly interesting in the files and didn't do anything very much with them, but both were hacked. Um, when I wrote that in our initial story, uh, Sean Spicer, who was then the spokesman at the um, RNC, and of course later briefly became the White House spokesman, um, denied it, turned out all kinds of Twitter statements saying this is all fantasy, but when you go back now into the, the public intelligence reports on this, they reported it as well. Now, now we're going to test you a little bit. Do you make predictions about where the next cyber attacks may be made? More to the point, where should we concentrate our defenses? It's a very good question. So all of you are not really targets that states are aiming at. You are the collateral damage in a state-on-state -state war going on 30,000 feet above your head. So you have to focus on those things that would disrupt your life and American life and American defenses the most. The good news is the utility companies and the financial industry have invested the most heavily in these systems because they're kind of out of business if they get attacked in a big way. And so the big banks have spent billions of dollars on this and hire up people from the NSA and Cyber Command. In fact, in Aspen, I was hearing a lot of people in the US government talk about how it's very easy to hire young people for an exciting mission and very hard to hold on to them because they're offered such big salaries to go work in the private sector. That's not all bad because 85% of the computer networks in America are in private hands. And so you will need to have private companies working on defending them. What we haven't figured out is what do we defend as a government versus what do we expect companies to defend versus what you defend. Now, you're responsible for a bit of your own defense. Look, you have locks on your house. You have an alarm system, probably, OK? That's because we expect that you're going to do some minimal defenses against having your house broken into. You have insurance. But you're not expecting that any of that is going to protect you against an incoming intercontinental ballistic missile. And for that, you're turning it over to the US government. And one of the big things we need to do is figure out where that line is. That would be a really great job for, say, the White House cyber coordinator. <laughs> if we still had one. President Trump got off to a very good start with two very talented people atop the White House cyber operations. John Bolton got rid of both of them in his first week in office and has eliminated the White House Cyber Coordination Office because clearly our government is over-coordinated on these issues. Um, and it worries me a lot because a lot of these issues that they were off to a start in picking up from on the Obama administration and learning the lessons that you've seen here and will read about in the book, they're not continuing right with right now. This is, is related in some ways to that. The, the question is, what should we do to protect elections? And what should we do at our own level? So elections are a relatively easy thing. The great news about our election system is it's spread out over 50 states, and every one of them does it differently in that true American way. And so it would be pretty hard to go hack an American election while it would be relatively easier to do one in Europe where they tend to have one unified system across the entire country. The simple answer here is whatever election systems you use in your state, it needs a paper backup. There are some things too important to trust to purely electronic technology. So that if there was a problem, and we did suspect someone was manipulating this stuff, 
there would be a way to go back and count by hand. It would be long, it would be laborious, it would look a lot like the hanging chads in Florida, okay? But at the end of the day, you'd have a real paper record. Do you think that the NSA has its cyber weapons sufficiently locked down? Um, boy, is that a leading question. I um, didn't go into it for purposes of time, but those of you who are interested in this issue may want to read a little bit in the book about something called the Shadow Brokers, which we believe now is a Russian front that obtained through an insider in the NSA the trove of the American arsenal of weapons, of cyber weapons, in 2016 and began publishing them. We may not have, a lot of Americans didn't notice because we had some other stuff going on in the fall of 2016. But the fact of the matter is that the WannaCry attack that took out the British healthcare service last year was designed in part with weapons that were stolen from the United States government. Now, if this had been a missile and we had lost it and somebody fired it back at an American ally, I would argue there would be court martials. But because so much about cyber is classified and kept overly secret, and I argue in the book wildly overly secret, people were able to basically evade having to answer the question, how did these American weapons get out? In fact, the US government has not even admitted that they were their weapons, though it's pretty clear that they were. And it wasn't just the North Koreans who got them. We've begun to see others, other elements of these American weapon systems show up in other attacks aimed at us. Can you comment on changes in the nature of diplomacy that the prospect of cyber conflict at any level requires? It's a great question because if you believe what I believe, that you're going to need an arms control situation here, then you're going to need a whole new way of diplomacy to begin to get at that. And there were some efforts in the Obama administration to start that, both in the administration and at the United Nations, and to get nations, many different nations, to sign up to it. Um, it's not surprising to you, the new administration's view is the best kind of defense here is to strike back pretty quickly and then create your norms country by country after that. The difficulty is the escalation issue I discussed with you before. So President Obama did not want to strike back at the Russians before the election because he was afraid that they would come back on election day and mess with our election machines if they were able to and play into what they viewed at the time as Donald Trump's meme that these elections are rigged. So the president decided just to warn Putin in private but not get out and make a big deal in public. And the theory was pretty simple, that after the election we do a bunch of penalties against the Russians and then Hillary Clinton, the next president, would pick this project up and continue it. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. The president Obama did do a few sanctions against the Russians, and President Trump has done more since, but it was mostly throwing diplomats out of the country, diplomats who were essentially spies. Or, as you'll see in the book, for those of you who make their way into that, uh, one American diplomat said to me, it was the perfect 19th century response to a 21st century problem. I think this is a wonderful last question. What are the top three actions that one takes to protect oneself from a cyber attack? Okay, so this is relatively easy. I mentioned one, doing the um, two-factor authentication. A second easy one is make sure that you're trained to understand what spear phishing looks like so that if you get uh, an um, email that uh, calls for you to go enter in all of your passwords and reset things, and it looks like it comes from Google, but it really may not, that you don't make the mistake that John Podesta made. Okay? Um, and it was actually John Podesta's aide who made it, but since he's a stand-up guy, he, he took the responsibility himself. The third thing you want to do is make sure 
that you have locked down your home networks and the networks you're on with the same care that you've locked down your house. Now, is this going to protect you against the Russians and the Chinese and the Iranians and the North Koreans? No. If there's a dedicated state actor who's coming after you, might as well just give it up, OK? But the Russians and the Chinese and the North Koreans and the Iranians probably don't care that much about you as an individual. And so what you're protecting yourself against is sort of common criminal kind of stuff. Although that criminal may not be an American, might be an Eastern European, might be somebody who's you know, working on collecting credit card numbers. Over time, we have to change a few bigger things too. First of all, social security numbers were never intended to be a password. They are the worst possible thing to use as a password. Because the main thing you want in a password is the ability to change it. Ever tried changing your social security number? <laughs> so, you know, this was not the concept of the social security number when Franklin Roosevelt invented the system, right? Um, so we're going to need to move to some things that are a lot more accurate than mere passwords. You're seeing Apple begin to develop that with the iPhone 10 which you know, does the facial recognition thing, although people have figured out how to beat that. It's relatively hard to beat. Same thing for a fingerprint reader. So we're gradually moving to technologies that 10 years ago were only in James Bond movies and that now are in your pocket. And that's a good thing. Now, where is this going in the future? Artificial intelligence, quantum computing. I'll save you, given the hour, the description of quantum computing. Um, are all going to change all of this because old password systems, not just for your bank account, but say for our nuclear weapons, that would take months or years or decades or centuries to break, are going to get broken in seconds. And so we're going to have to learn how to use this new technology to design new protections, just as our adversaries are going to use it to crack our old protections. Thank you very much. Thank you.